This Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS. PCGS is offering its 30th anniversary retro holder for a special price. Visit www.pcgs.com to learn more. Numismatic booksellers Colby and Fanning have changed the face of the numismatic book market. Offering more than just seldom seen selections of books and literary archive material, the scholarly duo's research into these items has added tremendously to our understanding of the hobby's past. In this episode of the Coin Week podcast, I talked to Dr. David Fanning about numismatic books, the colorful characters that have populated this hobby, and why serious collectors today care so much about preserving this aspect of the hobby's past. Well, hi, David. Thanks for joining us on the Coin Week podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for asking. So, Dave, I'm a bit of a numismatic bibliophile, and I'm sure I'm not alone as a bibliophile, as they probably make up the bulk of your clientele. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got uh, people all over the world, literally. What is it about numismatic books that excites collectors and oftentimes makes them hold on to these books for longer than they hold on to the coins that they describe? No, that's uh, that's true, and a lot of people end up uh, holding on to their books even after they've sold their coins. Um, and there are certainly a lot of cases where the books are more rare uh, than the coins. I think part of it, well, part of it's just, you know, simple information and that sort of thing. But I think a bigger part of it is this sense of fellowship among other collectors. Uh, this feeling that we share something in common with someone who was collecting and studying coins, say, in the 19th century, uh, that there's some, there's some bond there. And it's really not overstating it to call it that. Um, you know, when we talk about the provenance of a coin, for instance, you know, part of the reason that that's special and often enhances the value of the coin is because we do. We feel some sort of connection with the previous collector. Uh, and it is, uh, it's the same with the books. And uh, sometimes with the books, you get things like annotations, uh, signatures, that sort of thing, things that you know, make the connection a lot more uh, tangible than with a coin, where presumably they didn't engrave their name in it. Um, and uh, that, I think that appeals strongly to a lot of collectors. You know, one of the things, when I look at the books produced in this field, a lot of the books were written by enthusiastic amateurs or people who were professional in their knowledge, but maybe not in their approach or execution as writers. That's often true. And I think in some respects, getting back to the idea of provenance and pedigree when it comes to the ownership of coins, it seems like collecting a Chicago Coin Company catalog that was written by Virgil Brand allows us, in some respects today, to get into the psychology or the collector profile of this major figure. One anecdote in one of your most recent catalogs, you had a volume by Joseph Florimond Lobat. Uh -huh. And one of the great things about numismatic literature catalogs, especially the work of you and your partner, George Colby, is that there's a great deal of knowledge, insider knowledge. And that goes into the art of cataloging books. And the story you tell about his ostracism from the Union Club. Right. So how difficult is it to dig into this material in such a way where you're able to recall these colorful stories from the past? I don't want to overstate, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm overstating our own importance here, but I see part of our job is being sort of an institutional memory um, for the hobby. I know uh, for me personally and for, I, I know I can speak uh, for my partner George uh, on this matter as well, it is the history of the hobby, the history of coin collecting, whether it's in the United States or just in general, is to us just absolutely fascinating. Um, that is, you know, that's not how people start out. You know, you start out being fascinated by the coins, then maybe you start getting fascinated by the literature. 
But as you start to really know the literature and be and you're able to see the connection between you know this book that I'm looking at and the one that came out on the same topic ten years before it and the one that drew upon it five years later, you start to see all these connections and the history of the hobby and its development you know comes alive for you uh and it becomes very important uh to us um George and I. We both find that the history of numismatics has been, I mean, it's just drawn so many fascinating characters, uh, all sorts of different people. Um, a lot of them are pretty quirky. Um, they tend to accrue a lot of good stories. Um, and uh, so part of uh, why we write such often lengthy catalog descriptions uh, is, you know, it's it's not just that we're, you know, long-winded or don't know when to say when. It's just, uh, you know, we, we, we love telling these stories. They appeal to us. It's part of the reason that we like to collect, and we have to think that we're not alone in that, uh, and that other people might enjoy hearing uh, these stories as well. With Rare Coins, I think, you know, at least in the U.S. series, there's a pretty good understanding of what's out there. Now, you know, there's always surprises, but I think for the most part, people know where the best stuff is and in whose collections. Pretty mapped out, yeah. But uh, but how mapped out do you think the numismatic literature area is by comparison? Well, okay. Um, it became, until a generation ago, um, you know, it really hadn't been mapped out much at all. Uh, George Colby was not the first bookseller to focus on numismatics, but he was the first to really bring a very rigorous approach to it. Um, he was not just interested in selling current reference books. Uh, he wanted to tell the stories. He wanted to explain why he felt that the older literature was fascinating. Uh, and introduce uh, coin people to areas of the book collecting world that could be of interest to them. Um, so George's catalogs were like the, the first that really sounded like professional bookseller catalogs. Uh, the stuff that tended to come before were usually written by coin dealers who just ended up liking books. Um, and they weren't necessarily trained in bibliography, uh, they didn't necessarily spend their free time reading book catalogs. They were coin people, first and foremost. Uh, George came at it from the perspective of someone who was just as obsessed with books as he was with coins. Um, and I, my, my personal interests are more or less identical in that regard. Um, you know, the two hobbies are really of equal importance to me, and they've developed into much more than just hobbies. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's just, you know, just how that approach sort of developed. What do you think has changed since your partnership with George has taken hold in the market and your approach to it? The approach has only changed in the sense that we've had to adapt to the changing market. Um, our cataloging style, I think, has remained very consistent. Uh, we tend to write uh, fairly lengthy descriptions. Um, we get a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, we both always have ongoing research projects. I write a regular uh, column for the Asylum, which is the Numismatic Bibliomania Society's publication, on you know just kind of whatever has been uh, you know pricking my interest uh, recently. And uh, you know, so I, I think our cataloging style has remained more or less the same, but the market has been changing a lot in the last several years. And from a business perspective, we've had to adapt to that. So how exactly has the market changed, in your opinion? It's become a little more complicated. It's become a lot tougher, too. Um, making a living, you know, selling numismatic books is, uh, is, is not an easy thing right now. Um, what we're really seeing is mostly overdue effects from the uh, from the internet. A lot of information that one used to have to buy books for is now available pretty readily online. 
um, that has had a real effect on things. And then resources like the Newman, uh, the, the Newman Fa Foundation's uh, Numismatic Center, um, the portal, excuse me, um, you know, that has had a big influence because now a lot of this information that was kind of rarefied and only in the hands of very sophisticated collectors who knew where to look for it, now it's, you know, it's available for uh, anyone to uh, take a look at. Um, the bad side of that is that having access to that information may be enough for some people who used to be customers of ours. You know, they may no longer feel the need to buy the book if they can get the information elsewhere. Um, the potential good side is, of course, that an entire generation is going to come about who will first be introduced to people like the Chapman brothers, for instance, you know, early 20th century uh, catalogers. Uh, their first introduction to these sorts of works will be through something like the Newman Portal, and uh, some segment of that group is going to uh, like the idea of maybe owning original copies of some of these things. Um, but in the uh, in the short term, it has made selling certain types of numismatic books a lot more difficult. There's no question about that. You know, while I have nothing but good things to say about the professionalism and approach and the quality of the product, I do worry about the dissemination of that information removed from the cost of creation. Because... I think it's a values that continue research and the production of new numismatic works. In a contemporary sense, will content creators ever get their full due when the work they produce can be accessed in a sterile environment such as the Newman Numismatic Portal? And then who gets the credit? The portal or the creators of that material? Like you said, it's it's already hard enough to make a living. I was I'm forty five years old and I'm about, you know, as uh Young as you get where, you know, I still did my undergraduate degree without the Internet, um, you know. And so I was trained in how to do research, you know, using traditional uh, books, library resources. And uh, one thing that does concern me about, you know, research on the Internet um, in general is just that there tends to be a perception that everything is there. Um, so that if information is not on something like the Newman portal, well, it just doesn't exist. Uh, when, you know, that's simply not the case. Um, you know, there are estimates about the amount of real, you know, library-grade information that are as low as, you know, suggesting that as low as 10% of all that information may be available online. Um, now, that number is only going to go up, but still, it is, it's so easy to do research online that it kind of brings out the laziness in us. You know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, we tend to think, you know, if I have to get a, actually get out of my chair and, or much less get in my car and drive to a library or something, it's not really worth it. I'll just make do with what I can dig up in the next 10 minutes through Google. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing does not tend to result in the best research. Oh, yeah. No. I, I, in fact, you know, I think it already takes a quasi-amateur field and makes it even more amateur. The, yeah, there is that potential because, I mean, a lot of numismatic books are really wonderfully done. They're written by bright people. Some of them are genuinely scholarly. They're written by people with uh, real credentials. And, yeah, there are plenty of others that are, I mean, they're labors of love. Um, I don't want to sound real negative about them, but, you know, a lot of times you see these books and it's just amateur hour. Um, they don't even know, you know, what side of the page should be an odd number. Um, things like that can really get, kind of get under my skin uh, from, uh, you know, a book person's point of view. Um, but... Uh, yeah, that uh, and that's true. You know, if you're doing all of your research on Google, that means that the person sitting next to you can do the same research. Um, so what's the special about it? So let's talk a little bit about Sale 143. You just released your catalog for it. I just got my copy in the mail. What are some of your favorite lots in this offering? This is this is a neat sale uh, for a couple reasons. It has it has 
a very nice, wide-ranging library on foreign coins, mostly medieval and modern, a little bit of ancient, not as much, though. Um, but one of the things that really struck me is that it just has a lot of books that are hard to find, at least in this country. You know, books that were never distributed here, that, you know, the... Uh, the person who formed the library had to go out of his way to, you know, import and, uh, you know, order and deal with foreign language websites to order and stuff like that. It's tough. Um, but he does. He has a lot of books that we either haven't offered or haven't offered very often, uh, often on fairly obscure uh, topics. Um, you know, he's got some really good uh, Islamic material. He's got great Eastern European material. And a lot of it is very hard to find. Um, you'd be uh, hard-pressed to uh, find a lot of it online as well. Um, so that's uh, that's neat. I like something that ha I like a sale that has a really broad range in that way. Um, but perhaps the most important thing about this sale is that it contains an exceptional collection of early American auction catalogs. Uh, these are 19th century and early 20th century, definitely pre-war. Um, and, uh, yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful library of them. This guy really went out of his way to fill in blanks whenever he could. He tried to upgrade from unpriced copies to hand-priced copies or from unplated copies to plated copies when they were available. Um, it just has some wonderful items in it, including some very rare items that, uh, a couple real landmarks that I'd never handled before. You know, it's not a book, but an item I found interesting was the photographic negative of the King of Siam proof set. So, yeah, the, the, yeah, and that uh, and that actually uh, would have come from another party. Um, there's more than uh, the two consignments in here, uh, but yeah, we do deal in things. I mean, the bulk of what we sell are, tend to be books, periodicals, and auction catalogs. Um, but we do also deal in archival materials, which you know are often photographs uh, and that sort of thing, or you know manuscripts material, uh, things that are often unique uh, or are you know just survived through uh, some stroke of luck. And when is the live auction being held? This uh, that would be October twenty first. That would be a Friday, um, followed by a Saturday mail bid sale. And interested Coin Week podcast listeners can register to bid by going to Colby and Fanny's website, www.numaslit.com. Thanks so much for joining me, David, and good luck. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode of the Coin Week podcast, please share it with your friends. You can download all 40 plus episodes of the podcast for free on the iTunes Store or stream them online at coinweek.com. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan, signing off. Until next time, happy collecting.